Hidden gems are one of those odd anomalies in gaming. A hidden gem to one could be the favorite game of another. There's no telling when a hidden gem is truly a hidden gem, or just an older game whose player base has fallen by the wayside. Hello and welcome to Switch Scheme. In today's video, I will be going over my personal favorite hidden gems for the Nintendo Switch. I will cover some eShop exclusives that may have slipped by due to the massive amount of shovelware the system receives, as well as some of the rather well-received and rated games that either I don't hear anyone talk about or I noticed have a player base that is next to nothing. Keep in mind that this list is based on my personal experience as a Switch user and content creator. A hidden gem to me could be a shining diamond in your own personal collection. With all that being said, thanks for tuning in and I apologize for the drought of content on my channel. My mom passed away, I had to move to a new house, I then got COVID, and my work schedule has changed. But I'm back and ready to go. If you enjoy this list and want more, please drop a like so I know that it's well received. And if you want a specific game or list to be covered, let me know in the comments down below. Hit that sub button to see future coverage and ring the bell so you don't miss any future videos. Real quick before we take a look at the first game, note that these are not in any specific order, but I am saving my favorite for last. If you grew up in the 90s and were in a school computer lab at any point on a rainy day, you played Oregon Trail. You died from dysentery, your wagon wheels were broken, and the wagon often drowned in the river. This was our experience, and we absolutely loved it. We always wanted to name our characters after our friends and family with the hopes that we would make it to the promised land of freedom safely and happy. The original Oregon Trail was often used in the classroom as a teaching tool to help represent the difficulty that early settlers had on their multi-thousand mile journey across the Midwest. From hunting to managing illness to ensuring you had all the supplies you needed to get through the winter, this was just one of the many tools we used to learn this part of history. The updated version was released by Gameloft and it came out in 2011. Later, it was updated once again in 2021 for phones, leaving many curious how an updated version of this legendary nostalgic punch would be handled. Would it be muddled with microtransactions? Would it be a lazy port going fully off the member berry power? Well, thankfully, it was neither. And the new version we have on the Switch is actually a tremendously faithful, updated version of the game that we all love from our childhood. Gone are a lot of the worst aspects of the early version. Much of the RNG is toned down and it's made more controllable. And although you can still bust a wagon wheel randomly out of nowhere, you actually can prepare more appropriately for the issues that are at hand rather than just blindly praying that you make it from checkpoint to checkpoint. The updated system provides characters with deep enough stat lists and passives that let you utilize them where needed to try and get the most bang for your buck. Get a character with charming passives so maybe you can get better deals at the shop, or get someone who's optimistic to help keep morale up while on the journey. The game operates more like a proper roguelike now, which honestly leads to such a fun gameplay loop. You get as far as you can, learn from your mistakes, and prep for a new journey hoping to get farther than last time. Eventually, you unlock fast travel points so you can skip previously completed areas if you want, or of course, you can go from B to really challenge yourself each time. One reason I have this listed as my hidden gem is although most gamers post 30 will know of the Oregon Trail, I find that a lot of people I talk to who are younger think it's just some old game from a bygone era and refuse to give it a chance, and I think that is the case with this re-release on Switch, and to me that's a huge mistake. If you like roguelikes and simulation games, I truly believe that the Oregon Trail Deluxe Edition will be right up your alley. Now I know there's going to be a lot of people who are about to say, what? This isn't a hidden gem, this game is great. And that is fair, but please hear me out. Chained Echoes came out of nowhere on the eShop and gave us a spectacular look back into 90s JRPG stylings. It has a story that is relatively engaging, although a slog at times, and the combat was creative and fun to engage with. The reason I'm putting this on my list is because this game never got a physical release, and I know many people that I've spoken to have no idea that it exists. Yes, I do know that First Press Games is currently taking pre-orders for the physical version, but how many people who are casual players even know what First Press or Limited Run Games even is? The game of Chained Echoes has you on the continent of Atlantis as you follow a ragtag group of characters ranging from thieves and nobles and more with varying backgrounds. There's a huge war, a pretty on the nose weapon grade scare tactic used, and then an uneasy peace that we all know as gamers won't last when one kingdom inevitably goes against the promises that they've all made. The story isn't the strong point here, but it's not bad either, it just services the overall experience. What I'm really here for is the combat. I find the turn-based combat in this game to be extremely cool. In most games, you're limited heavily in regards to how many units you can bring into battle. One of my favorite games, Battle Chasers, only lets you bring three characters out of the six total characters that you can bring on the journey, which means that three are rarely if ever used, and that to me is such a huge waste. 
Chained Echoes has a neat workaround wherein each character you take into battle can partner with another, allowing for quick swaps, getting more characters involved with each encounter, and making you feel less screwed when you get into a battle where a bench character's abilities would actually serve you better than who you brought in. All you gotta do is swap them, and you're ready to go. And the one thing that I really think is a cherry on top is when you do swap in a new character, that new character gets to go immediately rather than having to wait until that character's turn comes back around. Beyond the awesome swapping mechanic that assists with strategizing against each enemy, another combat tactic you have to manage is your overdrive meter. As you use abilities, the meter will go up, increasing your stats and power. But if you go too far, you essentially overheat your team and it becomes more of a detriment than a boon. The game, however, will give you methods to build and reduce this meter based on the actions that your characters take, so you can mitigate the bar to hopefully prevent it from going too far forward. This prevents you from just button mashing your way through a fight, because if you don't manage that meter, you will overheat, screw yourself, and likely die. But managing it feels rewarding, because if you can keep it in the sweet spot, you see the benefits on screen when you smack an enemy harder than normal. There's a lot to do in terms of story and side quests, which means the value here is also great. I think the game can normally take between 30 to 40 hours, which is more than enough to fulfill that 90s JRPG nostalgia urge. The Mercenary series, including Mercenaries Rebirth, Call of the Wild Lynx, Mercenary Saga Chronicles, and more, is a series of tactical RPGs that I've never even heard of until I started collecting Switch games. I have never heard a single person mention this series, and I can see why. It's basically a copy and paste of Final Fantasy Tactics, and when you have games overshadowing it, such as Fire Emblem Engage, Fire Emblem Three Houses, Triangle Strategy, Tactics Over Reborn, and more, it just sits in obscurity waiting and hoping that someone rescues it from the deep end of the pool while its contemporaries stand on its head. The thing though is that the mercenary games are exactly what one needs when they want to play a Final Fantasy Tactics game, but they just don't want to replay that same story over and over. Mercenary Saga Chronicles has the first of the trilogy of games altogether, and each sequel after that contains a very familiar formula that any Final Fantasy Tactics fan will find welcome. Characters get the standard Thief, Fighter, Wizard starting class, which then over time and rank can go into more specific classes, a system that any tactical RPG fan will find right at home. Character facing is important to combat, and as you'd expect, each character will have a plethora of equipment and gear to cycle through so you can make it from beginning to end. One reason I feel this game series dropped out of most gamers' minds is because in reality, all the games are extremely similar when it comes to their story. Kingdoms at war, you are part of it, the end. There are some attempts at plot twists and intrigue, but I'll be honest, it's nothing special. I don't really play these games for the story. I play it because I love tactical RPGs, and this series has a very good system that harkens strongly to the best out there. If you've already beat Fire Emblem Engage, Three Houses, Advance Wars, Tactics Ogre, Triangle Strategy, or more, and are looking to continue that TRPG itch, Mercenary Saga Chronicles and the other Mercenaries games will help scratch it quite well. If you like difficult games, then I have one for you that you may not have heard of. Dicey Dungeons is one of the most difficult games in my collection, and when I tell you it's kicked my butt plenty of times, I mean it. The game's concept sees you playing as six game show contestants who are turned into dice and have to overcome fight after fight, battling their way to the end of the show in order to win. But the game's overseer, Lady Luck herself, has made sure that if luck is not on your side, you'll never see victory. The combat is card and dice based, and over the course of each run, you'll be building a deck that operates based on your ability to gather and combine dice to hit certain benchmarks. You get to choose which path to the end you want to go, and will have to do some minor deck building to make sure you have given yourself every advantage you can. Do you have a boss coming up that's weak to a certain element? Well, you better swap around some cards to make sure you're ready. It sounds simple and easy, of course, but just because you have a card that, say, deals fire damage when you need to, if you don't manage your dice pool properly, it'll be a dead card in your hand because of that mismanagement. Each of the six characters have their own passives that allow them to conduct battles different than the last, such as rolling more dice per turn or getting extra hits based on the actions you've taken. But all of these bonuses and benefits barely scratch the surface of the depth of combat and strategy that is going to drive your soul into the ground in a crushing manner. Their artwork is very nice in my opinion, and I think it has an undeniable charm that screams happy-go-lucky, easy-cozy, but in reality, this game is like a casino. It'll give you a free drink while ramming a rod up your rear end, draining you of all your cash and hope. The Printy Presents volumes are some of my favorite games on the Switch. I love when a company understands that games lost to time deserve to stay relevant to newer generations for as long as possible. NIS has a long history of RPGs, be them typical turn-based or tactical combat, and the Printy Presents games bring older titles to the forefront once again, bringing older mechanics to the modern audience. When I hear of NIS, I always hear people talk about Yeez 8 and Disgaea. 
maybe the Trail series, which I feel are sort of a hidden gem in their own right, but these Pretty Presents titles deserve some love too, just for the sake of giving us those older classics. I personally like the offerings of Volume 3 the most. One main reason is because we, in the West, finally get access to La Pucelle Ragnarok, and this was previously only released in Japan. Thankfully, this version has all the DLC content that was added to the PSP port, which means more for us to sink our teeth into. One aspect I really like of this game is that pretty much each chapter has multiple endings based on how you played it out. Do you have to fight a big end chapter boss, or did you play your cards right and make it one of your best friends? It's a really neat concept for a game that came out in the early 2000s when player choice was still in its early stages of inclusion. The other game on offer in Volume 3 is Rhapsody A Musical Adventure, which is much more lighthearted. It has a lot of that NIS humor that you see in their other titles, and it's a relatively easy game, but its fun nature makes it a relatively nice experience for just relaxing after a long day work. The main reason I think these Prinny Presents games fail to catch gamers' eyes and keep them in this hidden gem category is just the age of the games that they provide. Rhapsody, for example, is from 1998, and it looks like it's from 1998. The graphics in these older classics don't always hold up, and in an age of graphical realism, this can turn a lot of people off. It's really a shame, though. These older NIS games are classics in their library for a reason, and I highly suggest that if you love the NIS style of humor, tactical combat, or turn-based RPGs, and you want to play some oldies but goodies, then I really think you should give the Prinny Presents series a chance. Void Bastards received a good amount of fanfare with its PC version because, as with most first-person shooters, it controls wonderfully on the PC. The Switch version, however, didn't get as much love, and I'm pretty sure it's because they forgot one very major control scheme that most Switch gamers like, gyro controls. For many, it makes playing first-person shooters so much easier and immersive because the thumbsticks will always be inferior to mouse and keyboard. Void Bastards, though, is one of those games I like to refer as On The John Games. The type of game you play a round or two in the bathroom while you do your business. And the roguelite styling of the game lends itself very well to these short, quick play sessions. The Void Bastard gameplay loop has you trying to guide a spaceship from one point on the map to another, needing to stop between those two points to explore abandoned crafts and areas looking for supplies that you need to continue this extended journey to the end. Your Void Bastards, as they are called, will die and respawn as you continue to push towards the end goal. What makes the gameplay loop fun, though, is that each Void Bastard you control will get a set of randomly generated traits, good and bad, and these can lead to some amazing runs or hilariously embarrassing fails. This randomness is why I feel the game lends itself strongly to short play sessions, because in some cases, you'll get a bad roll and just barrel your Void Bastard into a derelict ship knowing that he's gonna cry at the first sign of an enemy. Which, honestly, may just aggravate you to no end, making you want to stop playing it and pick it up later when you hope to get a better roll. The enemies are pretty interesting, and they hilariously throw jabs at you, especially if you miss your shots. The environments do become a bit repetitive, but the cell shading art style makes it all look unique enough that it really doesn't bother me. It's a straightforward first-person shooter with a fun roguelike mechanism that, for me, makes Void Bastards one of my favorite short-term gaming kicks. Dead or School is one of those games that when you sit and watch a short clip of it, you might initially assume it's some janky shovelware that's only hope for popularity resides in its use of a hot girl on the cover, and you wouldn't be entirely wrong. But if, like an ogre, you peel back a few layers of the onion, what you find is actually a very competent and well-made side-scrolling action game that has a surprisingly deep story to tell. The story goes that almost 100 years have passed since the Great War in which mutants and humans fought it out. Humans were driven underground while the mutants, think monsters and creatures, not X-Men, now roam freely above ground, preventing humans from seeing the light of day ever again. You play as Hisako, a young girl who is fed up with the idea of never being able to see the surface, and through her studies strives to see one of those famous schools of old. Through her travels and adventures, she meets groups of humans who help unravel the story of the war and lead to different perspectives being placed in Hisako's mind. Again, it's deeper than you would have initially thought when you just see a big booba protag on the cover. But where this game shines and keeps itself firmly in one of my favorites is the combat. It's fast-paced, high-octane 2D combat where Hisako has access to three weapons. A standard gun slot, think assault rifles, sniper rifles, etc. An explosive slot, such as RPGs and bazookas. And a melee slot, with a plethora of options here as well, each with their own unique traits. Each weapon you bring can have modes inlaid on it, which alters its stats or even gives them more traits to help you in your battles. Speaking of battles, you have standard enemies who pose little threat to start, but the game does a great job of giving you more and more enemy types as you progress through each battle. And the bosses, which are epic in scale and a lot of fun to fight. 
The graphics aren't the best admittedly, and the rendered backgrounds are a bit outdated, probably owning to its indie background, but you're often so caught up in the combat and flashing lights and flying bullets that you rarely notice this fault. The game offers a very decent 20 plus hour campaign, and the story, although simple to start, has a great narrative that might keep you engaged from beginning to end. I love Pokemon, and I started my Pokemon journey when I was 10 years old. I received Pokemon Blue in a Game Boy Pocket for my birthday. However, the biggest issue that we Pokemon lovers have is that whenever a new game comes out that isn't Pokemon, but tries to capture the same monster battling and catching feel, it generally just pales in comparison to the incredibly balanced combat and monster designs that are so ingrained in our minds through years and years of nostalgia and exposure. One game I found that actually kept my attention long enough for me to finish it was Monster Crown. A small indie game that was kickstarted a few years ago with the primary goal of bringing Game Boy Color style gaming to modern players. I have so many Pokemon loving friends, and none of them have never heard of this game. They've only heard of other clones such as Temtem and obviously Pal World. One of the main reasons I stuck with Monster Crown was it wasn't aimed specifically at kids in the story department and I really appreciated this to no end. Look, I love Pokemon, always have, probably always will, but I cannot stand the storylines that you're forced to get through just to get to the best part of the game, the end game, where you breed and collect them all. The stories have gotten more and more G-rated as the years go on, where we went from Team Rocket slicing off slowpoke tails for cash and stealing Pokemon for crimes, to kids who skip school and are therefore in need of a smackdown just to be told they're skipping school because of bullies, which now makes you a bully because you just bullied them all into battle. Okay, I miss Team Rocket and Team Magma, Team Aqua trying to cover the world in lava and water, where I actually felt like they pose an existential threat to the world I was playing in. I'm sorry, but bullied kids skipping school just doesn't have the same feel. The story of Monster Crown sees you on an adventure to help save Crown Island from inevitable doom by way of tyrants and anti-heroes. It's nothing unique, but it's more mature than Pokemon's latest outings and I really appreciate it. The creature designs aren't the best, but I do think this is a design choice due to the urge to stick with simpler looks that translate well to the Game Boy Color aesthetic that the developers are going for. The game comes with a starting base number of 200 monsters to collect, which may sound small at first when you compare it to the over 1,000 in the recent offerings of Nintendo's Juggernaut, but these 200 are expounded upon through breeding different species together, which makes that number actually higher. It's a neat system that leads to tons of replayability as you want to see what monsters the game has to offer and you probably won't see them all in a single playthrough. The game isn't perfect, the balancing is a bit off and not all the designs are good, some are honestly disappointingly simple. But if you love Pokemon and want something meatier to chew on other than Nexamon or Temtem, I would say give Monster Crown a try. Movie tie-in games have a deservedly bad rap. They're often rushed pieces of junk that only serve to bring money into the pockets of CEOs based on the movie's popularity alone. The Mummy Demastered by Way Forward was based on one of the worst films in the last decade. A movie so bad that it caused Universal to completely scrap its entire plan for a monster movie cinematic universe based on the original lineup of The Mummy, Frankenstein, Wolfman, Dracula, and more. The developers in question way forward clearly learned a lot from their previous 2D Metroidvania hit, Aliens Infestation, and brought all their expertise to bear here in The Mummy. The Mummy Demastered very, and I mean very loosely resembles the movie it's based on, focusing more on using the environments to tell the story, a la Metroid, rather than shove the movie's plotline down your throat the entire way. You battle awesome bosses like a giant spider while probably also forgetting that this is supposed to be based on a Tom Cruise movie involving a vengeful mummy. One of the cool aspects is how the game handles your death. If you can make it back to where you died, you'll find and kill your zombified corpse, giving you all your upgrades and weapons back so you can continue your journey. It makes death feel less punishing because you still have a chance to get yourself back in the fight if you just play cautiously enough to get there. The game isn't terribly long, sitting at about 5 hours, but considering most people passed on this because of the movie it was based on, that's 5 hours missed of some of the best Metroidvania gaming that the Switch has to offer. If you'd follow my channel at all, you know one of my favorite games of all time is Resident Evil 2, with RE1 Remake being a close second. And it would come as no surprise to those who saw my horror list that Evil Tonight is going to be my final game of this list, and honestly, one that I hope you all give a chance. I have many friends who love horror games, and whenever I ask their favorites, it's always the same curated list. Outlast, Alien Isolation, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, maybe a Fatal Frame, but I have never had a single person say Evil Tonight. And once I pushed them to try it, they quickly understood why I hold it in such high regard. 
The game is an absolute gem of 2D top-down horror goodness. You play as Sylvia, an exorcist who has seen it all and she isn't afraid of squat. She takes on a new mission to help with a school of horrors and soon realizes she's actually in over her head, and now you have to help her survive the denizens of the performing arts schools that she's in. This game is what should have happened years ago during the age of Game Boy Advance when we were all begging to play a decent Resident Evil title on the go, and not whatever Resident Evil Gaiden was. The combat of Evil Tonight feels great. You hold the shoulder button to draw your weapon and fire using one of the face buttons. The screen shakes and the speakers pop with each shot as you hope to hit the enemies bearing in on you. The game features standard survival horror tropes such as puzzles, limited supplies, and moments of panic as you try to figure out how to handle a new threat. Where the game comes up short, I will admit wholeheartedly is the writing. Some of the lines are a bit dull and your character Sylvia says some really stupidly bad lines, but honestly, the gameplay, atmosphere, and blatant love letter to the Resident Evil series takes all that bad writing and makes it a footnote in my eyes. Evil Tonight is a game that I found by accident one day while hunting through the eShop sales and it has solidified itself as one of my top 10 Switch games of all time. I highly recommend this little horror gem to anyone, especially now with Halloween right around the corner. There you have it my friends, a top 10 list of some of my favorite hidden gems on the Nintendo Switch. I know not all of these games will be hidden gems in your opinion, so if you disagree with my list, please drop your own hidden gems down below. If you enjoyed the content, drop a like, it's super easy for you, helps me out tremendously, and if you want to see a specific list or game covered on the channel, shout it out in the comments as well. Until next time, have a great day.